Well, are you ready for, are you excited for this episode? And <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I think so. Yeah. It's, uh, I feel like I need you to just talk to me about this stuff. Cause <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I've been struggling yeah. with my own, uh, my own cell phone addiction these days. Mm. So, yeah, so this will be good for me. So the topic that we're talking about today is digital minimalism. And it's something that we've had, you know, good conversations about in the past mm -hmm. and really something that I think is at part of the heart of what we're doing here, part of our mission and really trying to create balance in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into some of these, deep, these, these questions or these ideas more so in this, talk, in this discussion, but how that relates to how deeply you can get into the flow state even. Uh, this whole idea of digital minimalism or, or technology and what it's doing to impact our abilities to reach like a flow state, mm -hmm. I think is, is something interesting and we're going to talk about. But just, um, just to kind of lay the groundwork, the foundation, the, uh, the term digital minimalism is fairly new as far as I understand it. And it's really been popularized because Cal Newport wrote this book called Digital Minimalism which came out in February. Uh, I'll definitely include a link in the show notes to this episode because it's, in my opinion, something that should be compulsory reading for, if not high school kids, then mm -hmm. first year sociology or psychology students, something like that, where just to realize what's happened to the world because of uh, essentially what is tech addiction, uh, addiction to technologies and social media and the ways that they in many ways, they negatively impact our lives. There's lots of benefits there too, or lots of good things, but there's you've got to you've got to create balance. Mm -hmm. It's all about finding more balance, and um, and so yeah, the term digital minimalism or the idea is all about creating that balance and not becoming a slave to our our devices, our our technologies, and the social media platforms. And so it's being able to connect deeply in the real world, which some people, many people are losing the ability to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's really at the foundation of it all. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of last week, you sent me a message about, should we do the topic digital minimalism now? And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I've been struggling quite a bit with that myself. And so even, even up to this point, I kind of, because we were, we were going to do it last week, but with the, the workshop that you were doing, we kind of postponed it and everything. So I kind of jumped the gun and already started with implementing some of the tactics that I think we can share today and, and kind of encourage people to, to incorporate more. Uh, so, so the next thing that uh, with digital minimalism one of the reasons why this has become such an important topic, there's, there's some people that are arguing, oh, we just need to accept it. It's part of the way the world is now. Mm -hmm. We just have to embrace this whole like social media thing because that's how we communicate these days. And the, there, there's some faulty logic there. I know lots of people that are really, you know, deep into the online marketing and, and, uh, and social media sphere are, are saying that, yeah, we just have to embrace it. There's nothing we can do about it except become part of this, this world that we're in now, what we've now got to live with. And I think that you saw some of that with your, your recent course that you were doing. Mm -hmm. There was a pretty heavy debate about this, right? Yeah, yeah. There, I took a media studies course, and the big debate was whether or not social media or just the media in general is good or bad for humanity and it was interesting because the divide and the the people who created this debate like younger generations are for it and older more traditional generations are saying like I can see how this has changed human behavior for the worse um, so there's that big conversation of is this just the evolution of like the way the world's going and is this just part of human evolution like we're eventually becoming cyborgs if you will like mm -hmm. just becoming so connected and so like it's so ingrained in us to have technology um, do we just go with that flow do we let it happen 
because that's the way it's going? Or do we fight for it and, and go with the older generation's theory that like it's, you know, it's, it's changing humans? So the argument is that, yeah, it's changing human behavior, but evolution always does that. So what's good, what's bad? Mm -hmm. We're not sure. Yeah. And we'll never really know <laughs> until we get there. Um, yeah, so that's a, uh, it, it's interesting and um, I, I don't, I think some of it is, especially even within the digital minimalism book, Cal Newport talks about how if you've got that past where there were no cell phones and even prior to internet and everything, you can cut, you can more clearly see the difference. Whereas if you've grown up, you know, two year old kids now are able to use an iPad basically instantly. They, they, they've just got the intuitive ability to do it and they grow up with, uh, I think, I don't think it was from digital minimalism, but I heard this somewhere else where somebody gave a, a child like a paper book or either a journal and they were trying to press it like a, like an oh, iPad. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, it, that's something something that happened in the last couple of months, or there was a video that I went think viral a video, about yeah. it. Yeah, which is kind of sad. Totally. <laughs> it made me feel yeah, it made yeah. me kind of icky. Like that's the that's sort of at the heart of some of these these issues. Like we can't forget where we came from just because of the way the world is now. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, there's there's tons of value to things like like paper books and everything like it's that's sacred now yeah, yeah. totally um, but even even deeper at the heart of this issue are the things people are saying when it comes to the way social media is impacting their lives so you know there's there's a feeling of exhaustion like you're you just have to always be either online or you always have to be that persona that you portray online there's there's the issue of um, like people are saying that they feel more lonely mm -hmm. there's there's like this this epidemic of loneliness even though we are technically more connected but one of the the divisions is uh, that Cal Newport makes in the book that a lot of these researchers into some of the downfalls of, of social media are that it's it is a connection but a connection is not the same as a conversation mm -hmm. And conversation is what we thrive on and really kind of is how you build deeper relationships. Uh, so it's, it's more super, superficial, right? You don't have the, you don't have like the, the body language aspect. There's a lot more that goes into conversation than just yeah. typing some, some uh, keys on a page and, and getting it to yeah. send to somebody else, you know? Well, yeah, we were looking at psych studies in this course and, they're just saying how like the brain itself is kind of lonely because it's not stimulated in all the ways that it would be from conversation or human interaction. Mm. When you're just reading from a screen, you're just reading. You don't have a sensory experience beyond visual. And and that's really, I mean, besides videos and what have you, but it's, it's causing, unfortunately, a, a lot of loneliness because of that. Mm. We're also seeing, um, huge rise in anxiety, especially in young people, which is really terrifying because anxiety can really take over and, and harm people and then it's this spiral effect of inhibiting social interactions and then now it's like these people are stuck. Um, Sherry Turkle is a really interesting, uh, she's a psychologist but she has a lot of TED Talks too, so if anyone wants to look her up, um, I highly recommend it because she does talk about the digital age and she wrote a book called Growing Up Tethered. Um, which she does a TED talk on to kind of condense it for people like me who <laughs> don't always finish books, <laughs> but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but she was talking about high school students and, and their growing anxiety and, and the high school students, the people that we assume are just into it and excited about social media are reporting that they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Like they are tired and they're anxious and they're all, their parents are always texting them like, oh, did you get to your friend's house safely? Um, or text me when you get home or all these things. And now there's this, like parents are getting anxious because their kids are tired of holding their phones. So their kids are turning their phones off to be with their friends, which I think is a really cool conscious shift. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then parents are getting anxious because they're not hearing from their child. And we've created this new social script of like needing to text someone to make sure that they're alive. And when we don't hear back from them, our brains just do this whole like, whoa, something must be wrong, right? So it's unfortunate that this, this as Sherry Turkle calls it, uh, tether that we have is causing such a central nervous system reaction. Like we've got that anxiety. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, that's a, she's, you know, a, a key player in the book and the development of this mm -hmm. digital minimalism book, and and you know, uh, Cal Newport pulls a lot from from the Growing Up Tethered book, so that's one also cool. include that one because it, it's you know it's central to a lot of these issues that he reports on that he's trying to encourage people to get away from, mm -hmm. and the whole philosophy behind the digital minimalism is a lot because of Sherry Turkle, and I think we've mentioned her on the yeah. on, on an episode already before because, yeah, her her work is super important mm -hmm. to to all of this, and it's, um, yeah, it's not only like the high school students, but one of the shocking revelations that I think ties this all together um, is, is like this correlation that happened when Facebook went sort of widespread in mm -hmm. So I think like 2005, and that was where all these schools, all these universities and colleges across the U.S. saw this massive spike in anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. in the in the um, medical officers uh, area or whatever in in the in the in the in the, in the schools, mm -hmm. and so that's where obviously something that goes into like a crazy hockey stick curve of anxiety being reported is something to pay attention to because there's something happening that's changed mm -hmm. and I mean a lot of people are tying this into when Facebook went uh, went public or when went widespread whatever it was um, something that I kind of thought was interesting I mean it is a correlation I th it seems to be the reason though it seems to have something to do because of all these other aspects that we we know are kind of negatively tied to social media and being very compulsively using social media. But the other thing is, I wonder sometimes, it's kind of like when this this era of like vulnerability being okay started coming out. <laughs> and I wonder if the only reason that there, or if one of the, part of the reason that there's this shift in, in seeing more anxiety is also because it's more acceptable to talk about it. Oh yeah, I mean, you scroll through your Instagram and ask how many people are pouring their heart out on there, mm -hmm. um, which I wonder if it's, I don't know, I don't have numbers or studies on this, but I do wonder if there's a little bit of anxiety around the fact like, oh my gosh, I shared that on Instagram and now I know you saw it and I'm seeing you face to face and now you know my deep dark secrets and it's, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's creating this kind of illusion of um, like the safe space to post all this stuff and then you see someone in person and they're scared to actually talk to you and that's a really good picture of how it's not actually having a conversation over mm -hmm. social media right because you're you're posting stuff because it's safe to do so like you're behind a screen you've got that protection that protective barrier and then you see people in real life and it becomes scary again so it's mm -hmm. yeah a little bit of a disconnect there and I'm yeah. speaking for like I've done that, so I know. Sure. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. It definitely makes. I think it muddles the conversation a little bit from being this clear, clear line that it's simply a cause of it, it's you know a causation effect of social media creating this anxiety. Maybe it's maybe it is somewhat the other way around that uh, it's it's got to do with like this vulnerability shift too. It's interesting, I don't know. Yeah. Um, something, to, something to think about or at least consider that uh, there's, it's not so clear cut, but we are seeing, you know, there's also, I definitely think there's a downside to getting to the flow state. And that's something that, you know, we'll, uh, we'll definitely focus on. Um, or at least make make a point clear because if you are trying to achieve something bigger, if you're trying to accomplish a, a greater goal or reach towards your passion, you can't be checking mm -hmm. social media constantly. It's just a distraction. It's like the 
we can't multitask well, right? So it's the same, the same idea there. We've got to create some discipline at least yeah. to shut it off or block any notifications so that we have that time to get into a deep work state. Mm -hmm. Once again, another Cal Newport phrase. <laughs> Shout out to Cal. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and essentially reach that deeper state of flow with whatever we, we want to accomplish. Totally. Um, and so I think that's uh, part of, so that's part of what I guess we can kind of help mm -hmm figure out for everybody and mm -hmm. kind of create a, a call to action as well on challenging yourself to be a little bit better, be a little more diligent with your technology use. And I think I, I like this, this cool idea from the book um, with create a philosophy of technology use. So mm -hmm. do something, or basically you can write it down on paper or just think about it in your head first, whatever, come, come up with an idea of how you want to use technology in your life, how you want to incorporate it in your life without it kind of becoming the master and you the slave to the technology and the social media and everything. Kind of flip the script and the first step is recognizing and creating this awareness around it. Seeing that, um, well, all of our phones now have like screen time or mm -hmm. I, uh, there's a, I think there's another one on Android, I forget the name of it, but essentially all of our phones show you, or there's other apps too, that show you how much time you're using each sort of segment of, of app style. So you've got that one for social media and take, take note of that for a few days or a week or whatever and, and start to build an idea around just how much you're using your, your phone because a lot of people don't realize it. So it is scary. I think Facebook, most on average people, use Facebook for 60 minutes a day and we check our phones on average 80 times a day and well, it just kind of goes on and on right mm -hmm. uh, if you you factor in like television like the amount of TV that's being watched oh it's ridiculous yeah so we're, we're losing <laughs> all this time in our day yeah and, and people say they don't have time for their priorities that's, or lack thereof yeah that's the thing that's what that's what's at the heart of the digital minimalism thing is yeah. You, you get you find this freedom to accomplish bigger goals, to create new habits and find new passions because you've got this extra time that wasn't like, you know, was just sort of being eaten up by low quality activities. Yeah. And so crazy. It is crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, one of my favorite first steps, which even I've written about before is like the notifications off. Mm -hmm. So after you go through and you realize how much time's being eaten up by your, your sort of compulsive, it is a compulsive checking because I guess the next, I'll get into that in a second. Why, <laughs> why there's a compulsive checking yeah. aspect. First off notifications off. So, so turn off those notifications for basically everything. Uh, Cal Newport gets as extreme as even saying like turn off the met like even your text message notifications and set sort of guidelines text messaging was never meant to be like an instant response thing mm -hmm. just like email is not supposed to be so an it's instant like a short response email, thing. Right? Yeah. yeah and so you create sort of this um, for a lot of people it's scary because like you just, like you mentioned the, the parents texting the kids mm -hmm. to see if they're okay it, it, it's scary to people. Um, I was just going to say, like, guys, how many of you, when RJ just said, turn off your notifications, was like, oh my gosh, but what if? And what if? And what if I get an email about this? And what if someone's texting me about this? Like, Yeah. And so I think one of, the, one of the most important parts that you can really incorporate this in with is to start by reaching out to those people that you care about the most and there's two things you can do. You can either put them on, you can kind of like favorite them as like mm -hmm. a contact so that even if the text message doesn't go through, if you got like do not disturb on your phone or set up on your phone, you can still override that with anybody that phones you that's like on a VIP list is going to actually get through to you still. Yeah. So you can do that. That's kind of like a fail safe. Cool. Um, you can also, 
one of the recommendations is to start by, you know, blasting out to anybody that's close to you, like, hey, I check my text messages at these times per day, and this goes into even like the some of the, what Tim Ferriss talks about in the four hour work week in in creating these blocks or these mm -hmm. batches Batching, yeah. um, where you do certain activities. So text messaging could be batched in with with email checking. And so like I mentioned, I got a head start with this this week and so yeah. I've actually been scheduling in my email times. Uh, if that scares some people, I haven't had to do it yet because you know right now, I'm not getting like a ton of like VI like super important urgent emails mm -hmm. and so it's not been an issue for me I think a lot of people are going to realize that too so first off it's probably not as much of an issue as you make it out to be yeah. that fear response is more ingrained in us because of this this sort of world this technology and the way it sort of you feel like you're not relevant if you're not responding right away uh, that's part of this whole issue but realize that um, yeah, checking email like twice a day, which I've batched in essentially mm -hmm. for 10.30 and 4 p.m. So half an hour twice a day is plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't even, even, if I don't need that whole time, then I don't use it. And then the kind of sort of added into that, the social media part of it. So batching that, kind of stacking it together with that email time. So I've got like this half hour block twice a day instead of it being, uh, yeah, like whenever mm -hmm. that urge hits, which it will hit oh, yeah. a ton of times. Like, a, like, like I said, people check their phones 70, 80 times a day. So mm -hmm. the urge hits a lot. And it, the next step is creating more productive things to do with that mm -hmm. free time so that you're not sitting there twiddling, twiddling your thumbs and creating like that, that state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could meditate more, but that's not what everybody's going to do. So <laughs> the other thing is you've got to start to incorporate checking social media again, but also make sure you've got enough things to do mm -hmm. that are, you know, big enough challenges, kind of fun enough as well, that you're going to want to do them totally. while that urge kind of abates after a little while. Yeah. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the first step. And it's good. I was just gonna say it's funny. Um, almost every single person who walks into my apartment goes, "Where's your TV?" Because it's like this social expectation to have a TV in an apartment. Like it's home. That's where your TV is. And I'm like, I don't have one. And they're like, "Well, how do you watch stuff?" Like, well, I don't. <laughs> what do you do? I go outside. I play with my dog. I go to the gym got time for these things because I don't have a TV because I don't spend time watching it and I think that that's it's really interesting just to see because I don't have a TV I watch how much other people watch TV and I'm like dude you just spent like two hours sitting and as someone who's a mover I can't do that <laughs> first of all but it's really interesting because then these are the people that say I don't have time to do that or you know they're complaining about just speaking in, in my trainer life, people complain about, you know, not being motivated to go to the gym or not being, not liking their bodies or something, but then I don't have time to go to the gym. And I'm here to say you do, <laughs> you have time to take care of yourself, but it has to come with the removal of, of that stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that was part of, I think that was part of my spiral out of control because I wanted to get through the end of Game of Thrones. Right. And so the last, yeah, that ate up a lot of time. Uh, I did kind of, I don't know, I got everything else done that I needed to, but I realized like how much time that kills. And you said it bothered your sleep, didn't it? It did too. Yeah, yeah because, well, <laughs> that's something. After that day. It is. Uh, I mean, this also goes into the whole thing about blue light at night. Mm -hmm. And so part of the reasons that. Uh, yeah, yet another reason to limit screen time of any sort is that all of these devices emit blue light that actually inhibits melatonin production mm -hmm. and reduces your sleep quality. So that's why, I mean, some people notice, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize that every phone and every device basically has this option to filter out blue light now when the sun sets which is really valuable to turn on if you've got mm -hmm. your, your phone handy, like do it right now, turn on 
the uh, it's either called uh, night shift or uh, I think it's just called like a blue light filter on on um, yeah, Android just, or sunset mode or something, something like, like that, that. Yeah. anyway like turn that Change on settings. because I mean at, at first it might feel a little weird that like your screen's kind of turned yellow but you'll quickly adapt to it and actually sleep better because of it mm -hmm. uh, and so that's part of the reason why it's recommended that the last couple hours before bed you don't have your TV on like shift to reading paper books um, <laughs> this is something that you know I, I go back and forth with a whole lot and and kind of stress over sometimes because it depending on what book I'm reading it's like can I read on a Kindle and it's not going to be the end of the world, uh, especially because you can turn down the, the backlight on the Kindle and actually read it under a sort of on, under a normal light, or even it's not. You can still do it on an iPad if if that's kind of your only choice, or on a tablet with that night shift on. There's still some light that's being emitted that it, it's not going to be the end of the world compared to like a full blue light TV going, but. Uh, try to shift to the paperback books. I think it's a better quality read anyway. Like um, I've noticed it, and like a lot of people that kind of research this, study this, tell you that you actually retain more information from reading a paper mm -hmm. book instead of instead of like a digital device. Part of the reason is like you kind of appreciate the information more because you've got this thick book that you're reading mm -hmm. through. You see where you are in the progress of the book. It's a lot harder to do that with a digital device where the page flip doesn't actually amount to like how far through the book you are. Mm -hmm. And it's also another factor here is that you don't get as many um, sort of like coincidental landings to tie the information together if you're just flipping through the pages. Uh, it's a lot easier to flip through the pages in a paper book to go back to like something kind of sparks like a, a reminder where you're at in the book or you want to jump forward to something to see where it's leading. Uh, primarily, I guess, for nonfiction, but also for fiction there. And um, so, yeah, I, it's something, that's another thing that I could go off on for a pretty long time is this whole mm -hmm. divide between paper books and, and digital devices for reading. But essentially, yeah, I, I, I tend to shift it back towards liking paper books for a lot of these reasons that that researchers are suggesting it's a better form of of uh, memory like basically forming the ideas and the and getting more out of it yeah i want to touch on that a little bit um mm -hmm. we brought up i think in, in maybe it was the spring cleaning podcast about hyper reading a little bit mm -hmm. um and then we were like let's save that for this podcast so here we are but uh our our brains have been trained now thanks to things like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook to do what's called hyper reading on a device, which is just um, skim reading, having these, you know, I don't know what Twitter is now, 140 or did they have it's, it? Uh, it's like two, is it 240 40, now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're reading a short blurb and then you're moving on. We're scrolling. We're always just like onto the next thing. And so now our brains see a device and that's how we're taught to read. That's, you know, we practice that through scrolling through our phone, whether it's conscious or not. And uh, and now hyper reading is becoming normal. So when you're reading a book on a device, your brain is going to have a really hard time settling in to doing sort of like long form reading. Whereas we don't have that so much with a book, provided your phone's away from you. Um, but it's really tricky to train yourself, even going back to deep work. Like it's going to be tricky if you're used to hyper reading all the time, just out of habit trying to get into this flow state, this deep work state, where you're like doing this long-term constant stream of hard effort and work and concentration, you're not gonna have that if you're used to hyper reading. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be a bit of a practice and that's something I'd wanna say, just even for your little call to action here is like, be patient with yourself because you're going to wanna just like, you'll read these couple words and then your brain will go off and be like, okay, Where's my phone? Never mind. Okay. And then back at it. Um, so it's all a practice. I think I've said this in every podcast. Like what you practice is what you become good at. Whether And like I said, whether it's conscious or not, if you're scrolling through your phone all the time, you're practicing this high-speed pace of life, mm -hmm. which then anxiety, which then social issues. Like it's this huge spiral, right? So be patient, but understand that, you know, even deep work is a practice. Flow is a practice. 
That, yeah. That's a good point. And also another reason for trying to switch to paper books, in yeah. my opinion, yeah, is sorry, that's what there's <laughs> way less, way less temptation to want to, you know, swipe up the screen and switch to a different app, yeah. which is yeah. instant. Uh, if you've got a paper book and, the, and those digital devices are away, then you don't ha the temptation goes away because it's not as easily accessible. Mm -hmm. That's part of um, like all of this stuff that comes into practice. The more or the the less easily accessible these things are, actually the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know it's recommended put your phone in a different room when you're going to bed. Uh, don't have a TV in the bedroom. All of these things mm -hmm. uh, come come into play essentially to have uh, yeah better focus. Yeah. And so even the idea of setting up like a separate workspace or whatever where, or I think I mentioned to you the other day, like different devices for different purposes. So maybe you, if, so maybe your tablet's always on airplane mode and it's the only, it's, you only read on it, in which case it's less of like a multitasking thing. And same with like your work computer is the only place you do writing. Mm -hmm. So you're not trying to, you know, type out, um, a long letter on your your smartphone, which I don't know if you've ever tried before, but your thumbs get really sore. Yeah. It's the My worst. My eyes get sore. I get yeah. frustrated because I get clumsy and tight yeah. all around. And then like your your thumbs are like sore all day because it's like it's not natural. Oh, well, and it's, as a trainer, it is so bad. Yeah. I see so much internal rotation thanks to phones, and now we're trying to fix all these hunchback humans that we've created and this forward neck posture and then it restricts your breathing patterns like it's it's actually it's crazy how much just using your thumbs on a phone in this position mm -hmm. affects the body yeah in so many different aspects yeah but not to get too deep into that <laughs> but I was going to say that's also just what you were touching on there is like how sleep psychologists they like don't eat in your bed don't don't do things besides sleeping in your bed because your brain is now going to associate your bed with sleeping whereas even if you're scrolling through your phone in your bed um the your, the body's I mean it's brilliant but also it just does what it's told and if you're telling it like bed is where we watch TV bed is where we scroll through our phone bed is where we do this mm -hmm. it's not that direct link to sleeping and now you're gonna have trouble sleeping thanks to blue light but also habit yeah. um, which is you know not super fun because sleep anchors us all and keeps us alive and helps our bodies recover and function how it should and if we're interrupting that then everything else is interrupted too but uh yeah I like that like one I mean that would be it's I'm even thinking right now like for myself that would be hard for me to figure out which devices I use for just one thing these these platforms were engineered to be as addictive as possible like they have mm -hmm. they have like slot machine engineers working on creating the the most addictive features of social media mm -hmm. and that's why it's become such an issue is because it's, it's it's intended to keep you on there as long as possible yeah. so things like the like button and the colors that are chosen for the notifications you know they're bright red they they stand out they alert you like yeah. originally I, I don't even remember this Originally, the notifications on Facebook was a, like, a, like a blue color, like the rest of their I brand. Yeah. But then they switched it to the red because it, it like alerts you. And then, everybody's, yeah, and then everybody started incorporating these, these like things because they're small dopamine hits. Just like pulling down like the slot um, lever and getting like even a few pennies to come out, whatever. It's just, you know, it's just feeding this, this cycle of addictiveness because you get this this constant drip of dopamine from it. And that's what uh, is, a, is a, an effect of the like button and getting like a comment, even though it's super, super, like superficial stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and notifications, seeing how many notifications you've got, all of this stuff feeds into this addictive habit that it becomes and this co compulsive use once again, yeah. uh, because it's really like a digital slot machine in a lot of ways. It's, it's nice to hear that, um, or maybe not nice, but it's interesting to hear that comparison because um, I just recently went to the casino in Peterborough to check it out and see how it was. And like instantly the friend I was with was like, I feel sad here. And you look around and it's just a bunch of like lonely faced, like straight faced people 
robots just doing their things, pulling the levers, and no one, like there's not a good energy there. It's no one is very happy. And then it's neat to analyze, and I say neat just because I like psychology, not because I think it's a good thing. Um, when you're using the slot machine yourself, and you've already spent like 20 bucks, but you gain 25 cents, whoa, so exciting. Like, but then you realize, what you've given to get that 25 cents is really, that's not, that's not a win. You've already lost 20 bucks and then it, you know, and then you get seven cents and you're like, yes, because it lights up and it gets all exciting and you know, and then you get that notification or that like and whatever and, and your brain is like, sweet, that feels good. Mm -hmm. And then your dopamine system like is wired to release upon those things because now we've gamified social media, right? Gamification yeah. is just that idea of reward with that notification or in it's it was started in, in game theory like studying video games and stuff of just it feels good to win mm -hmm. it feels good to succeed and then we get all these things on the screen that light up and then in our brain we get the dopamine and it lights up and it gets all excited um, and now you're getting that through something as little and silly as a person that you may or may not know double tapping a photo and or following you yeah yeah and it's the same as that you know now you've just won seven cents on the slot machine that you've spent twenty dollars on. Cool. Yeah, you, you've <laughs> just you've just received seven likes. Yeah. But you wasted twenty minutes, sure. or you exactly. know, or comparatively, you you know, your quality of life has gone down x amount because of that, or yeah, all yeah. of that stuff. But I got fifty likes on my latest Instagram photo, so that feels pretty good, mm. right? Pretty yeah. Good. <laughs> Thanks, brain. Yeah. yeah. And now. Another part of this reason why there's anxiety behind it and, and the whole issue here is that everybody's starting to do those things to get the likes instead of the things that are meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Because we're chasing dopamine. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we're all addicts, right? In that, in that sense. And it, that's what I think can really suck your soul away, is that you're searching for the recognition of others, not actually enjoying the content you're putting into it because I do like not to bash social media because I do think it can be used positively provided that you use it consciously um, and for yourself not for the recognition of others yeah like this goes back to we all went to high school this is high school 101 like be yourself your mom always told you like don't follow the crowd but now we're seeing this in this social media sphere right totally yeah and no certainly not as you know, as we started out with, we're not trying to bash social media. We're yeah. just trying to create this conscious use, conscious, this more exactly. philosophy of, of use and recognizing some of these things. And actually, there was another, I, I recently listened to uh, Gabrielle Reese on Joe Rogan. She was talking about this a lot and kind of just how much effort it takes to avoid doing that thing that, that gets you all the likes on social media but that is more meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. And that's really why I wanted to like make this point. It's definitely a valuable episode. You know, she has a lot of insight into it as being like a former, um, I think she was on the Olympic team. She's a volleyball player. She's right. married to Laird Hamilton. Um, and just like recognizing like all of this stuff that goes into, you could, you could post a picture that you know is going to get a ton of likes, or you could post the one that's actually meaningful to you. To you. Mm -hmm. And it's a, there's, there's a huge dichotomy sometimes. Not always, but uh, because sometimes when you're being your most authentic self, you get the most response from those people that are, that, are, that do care about what you have to mm -hmm. say and everything that do, does have that value there. I think people are hungry for something that's real too, right? Mm -hmm. How, like a lot of people I think, whether they're there yet or they're still considering it, but a lot of people are trying to build up some sort of brand awareness of their own or be or running a business and things and I, I'm sure that a lot of the backlash comes with the idea that oh I can't do the digital minimalism thing because I'm trying to run a business mm -hmm. and the internet's the way that I run my business so with with somebody that's trying to run a business and thinking that they can't be like a digital minimalist mm -hmm. there's once again, it's about this philosophy of technology use. So create those boundaries for yourself. Like I already mentioned, batch your email. That's one step towards mm -hmm. digital minimalism. Like you don't have to eliminate everything. 
uh, a lot of a lot of people that are trying to tap into social media because it is it is a very affordable avenue of marketing and advertising. You know, you can you can time out your posts with apps like Later for Instagram or Hootsuite, Buffer. There's all kinds of them where you can do some of this batch work like a couple times a week, once a week, whatever works for you. And and then once again, if you've got time at the end of your email batch or whatever, you can go in and respond to those messages or whatever. Once again, you don't have to instantly respond to stuff. I know Facebook makes it seem very like pressured because if, as like a business, it's got that thing like they'll send you an email to make sure you respond to mm -hmm. somebody's message. It's like don't lose your your fast response status, uh, but build build up once again just like with responding into to the people in your in your closer network. Build up that expectation that you're not going to respond instantly, and and develop it like over time so that people know that it may take a couple hours or whatever, or like half a day or a full day whatever kind of level of, of uh, attention you want to those, those, those areas, but take, take your time with it uh, because it's better overall for like your mental health yeah. to not always be responding. Well, and like, to me, I'm just thinking as a consumer, if someone takes a little while to respond to me, my initial thought is like, oh, they must be really busy with their successful business. So if we want to create that illusion, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. As long as it's not like a couple weeks later, but if it's in that sure. same day, you know, I get a response. Yeah. I don't care if it's two, three hours later. Like, I got an answer, and that's. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I think it's important to clarify, like, when we say digital minim minimalism, and, you know, all you business people are like, can't do that, we don't mean get rid of digital anything. Like, we don't mean, like, stray away from technology. We just mean use it efficiently, use it yeah. to your best advantage. And this really. As a, as a, you know, someone in business, this can streamline and actually set you ahead. If you're scheduling your posts, you're thinking ahead. You know, if you're emailing people at certain times, you have this ability to be really conscious about your emails instead of just slapping together a response. Mm -hmm. So your networking now becomes a little bit more personal and a little bit more, you know, I guess personal is the word I'm looking for. I was yeah. going to say integrated, but that's not, that's just a big word to put there. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, I think it just helps focus everything oh, yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. it keeps you reaching goals and setting goals and being able to be like okay so we've got this timeline set out that's happening now I don't have to spend my day typing out posts I can actually use it to network to market get more content like do your thing yeah it's very true and it's also it's not you don't have to like completely shy away from or, or shun all these platforms either. Like Facebook mm -hmm. is still a great marketing platform. Just use it more consciously yeah. uh, and maybe a little more responsibly because like it's, it is a way to, uh, even even like with the guy, like the Zuck guy, like Roger, the, the guy who wrote the book Zuck, he still uses Facebook ads even though he's writing about mm -hmm. sort of the pitfalls of Facebook mm -hmm. because he knows that's where his audience is. And that's okay. Yeah. Just uh, just be like more deliberate with it and like your your own use and maybe sharing this, you know, spreading this awareness so that everybody's a little more aware of using things consciously mm -hmm. and deliberately. Um, and then the other side of like technology and business, it's um, a lot of businesses may encourage or may benefit in other ways from digital minimalism if they have like policies around cell phone use and work. And, uh, and, you know, maybe allowing people, for example, like, we, we know everybody wants to have their phone. There's a lot of businesses where you can't have the phone in, in the kitchen or on, the, on like, the, the line in the restaurant or whatever because then you've mm -hmm. got this contamination source yeah. and, and things like that. But people are itching for their technology use because it's addictive right mm -hmm. and and it's uh you were just mentioning right it's like it's like the new smoke break right yeah yeah that's something my my old boss was saying is that you know people in her day she's one of those 
before the internet people, right. <laughs> um, as am I, but I was too young to appreciate it. Um, at social gatherings, when people were feeling anxious or in need of a break, they go for a smoke until we realize smoking's bad. And now instead they pull out their cell phones and they get drowned in that. Um, turns out we're finding that that's bad for you too. So <laughs> we'll see what's next. But it's interesting, yeah, it's an escape, and it's a distraction, and it's not necessarily the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially, like, it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a way to quell that anxiety, but not, as we've, we've seen, it's kind of going to, it spirals out of control, mm -hmm. and it actually ends up leading to more anxiety. Mm -hmm. Learn learn better ways, you know, to to combat anxiety is like a lot of what we do here and what we're trying to encourage. So mm -hmm. things like breathing, uh, deep breathing instead of reaching right for your phone. Yeah. Cause even like the, even sometimes like that adrenaline response that can happen from social media or whatever, the excitement, the dopamine, mm -hmm. it's, it's leading you to forget about breathing or taking a, like a mindful moment. Just, just mm -hmm. be a little bit more meditative in that break that you need. If you need fresh air, like actually like, look at the skyline or something <laughs> and and appreciate nature instead of that digital device um definitely and so something that i i'm, I'm i don't think we'll get into today because it's a it's a long other topic that goes into this but it's something interesting because i just finished reading this book the uh non tinfoil guide to EMFs. Are you familiar with Ooh, EMFs at yeah, all? Yeah, I was gonna talk about EMFs, but I was thinking the same thing. It's gonna be it's it's a it would a be bigger a, podcast. It is like a longer topic and I'm still I'm still on the fence, but this book's very like uh down to earth. It's not as uh like woo woo or, mm -hmm. or out there. And he's He's pulling in. I, I, I still think I need to go to like the source material and see if my conclusions align with his. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I haven't seen a whole lot of good scientific evidence for there being any like harm to EMFs before, mm. but I, I think it's starting to to get there. I it's kind of scary. Yeah, and, quantum uh, physics things I don't pay attention to, right? So yeah. I don't have enough knowledge to say yay or nay to it. Yeah, but. Uh, Electromagnetic frequencies, if we didn't say what that, that is, by that, the way. That's right. So, uh, it's, it's packaged, there's a lot more to it because there's also the magnetic fields and the, like the radio frequencies, the radio fields. Um, but so EMFs, this idea that all of these electronics are emitting these, these electrical fields and the, the problem has become that our world is so connected now with like the next wave is going to be 5G but 4G phones and there's all of these radio waves in especially in cities and stuff uh, telephone lines and stuff mm -hmm. and the idea the hypothesis that is starting to get a little bit of evidence for it is that all of these fields actually interact with the cells in our bodies yeah. and can lead to damage yeah uh, I mean, it's just like the sun, right? The sun has these frequencies as well, and, and that's causing damage to our skin. Mm -hmm. So everything in this world vibrates at a frequency, right? Even the cells, even like this solid wood table is still like, in science, we see the electrons going around and around and around. Yeah. And they all interact with each other. So the same idea with EMFs is that this frequency is being emitted from technology, and it's interacting with, yeah, the cells in our bodies and those electrons that are spinning around in our cells and or in our atoms i should say mm -hmm. and uh it's causing an interaction of some sort well a lot of yeah are like, yeah they're saying the other the damage. other thing is like uh even on more even on a more macro level than that there's things like a lot of our body uses electrical impulses or essentially our body yeah. is made up of electrical impulses things like uh, voltage gated calcium channels in the cells uh re react to electrical impulses and open up and essentially uh, lead to, you know, uh, cast metabolic cascades of, of like calcium, then the calcium ion basically activates different things, mm -hmm. uh, goes through the pathways into uh, like DNA transcription into, into creating some sort of mechanism. Depends on which cell it is and what's going on, but it can lead to things like sure. overactive cells 
which then can either mutate or or um, lead to like apoptosis where they're like they're dying off. Scary, yeah. Yeah, it's scary stuff. And there's some evidence that like even though people say that like these devices are in the safe range of frequency, it's kind of like you know there are those. Those non those ionizing radi radiations like uh, with X rays and stuff, mm -hmm. which we know you, you, you're limited to how many X rays you can have because the radiation or, and the, the energy level is too high. Yeah. It damages cells. But these non ionizing radi radiations are now being sort of stacked on top of each other to such a level that there is becoming issues. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a a clear like incidence of lower like. Um, like sperm count and male fertility with cell phones being kept in the pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Same all, with female all, reproduction, it's yeah, shown to be faulty. Um, like breast cancer incidents because of like keeping the phone in like your, your a pocket of the chest or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and things like that are actually starting to like come around and be a little more scary. And mm -hmm. uh, sleep quality, everything seems like there seems to be an argument you can go into this book is very thorough in talking about the different ways that EMFs may impact our health and like ways to reduce it mm -hmm. essentially some of them are like some of the most simple ones he suggests I don't really know how to implement this one yet but your phone if you're carrying your phone on you put it on airplane mode mm -hmm. so I don't really know how that works if you're like expecting a, I guess if you're expecting a phone call you need to but you're supposed to have your phone on on airplane mode at all times if you're carrying it um, something that's in the fine print of all cell phone manufacturers you're not actually supposed to hold your phone up to your head which is scary because most people yeah. do that yeah. uh, because there it's so close to your brain mm -hmm. which is is ridiculous in some ways but that's also something that's recommended that you're supposed to either use speakerphone or, or like a wired in headphone set are the ways to limit that exposure to your brain it's crazy to think it's, about yeah it's interesting you, this this um the idea that x-rays is like a one time every now and then thing and then the the idea that maybe your phone should be treated the same way reminds me of something i learned in a nutrition class i took um, in the food industry, they have an acronym called GRAS, G-A-R-S, generally regarded as safe. Generally. Mm -hmm. Great, right? Yeah. Um, and they're talking about putting, you know, additives in food, so like colorants or aspartame or these things where it's, you know, we've studied it, it's generally regarded as safe. It's okay to use your cell phone a little bit. Um, but what they don't factor in, or what they don't study because it's not on them, it's on you as a person, is that... It's generally regarded as safe for one serving. So you're having maybe like a, a Coke with aspartame and colorants and that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's okay for your body, you know, it's not going to kill you if you do one serving. Or your phone, it's not going to kill you if you're on it for a couple minutes a day. But what they don't study is, you know, there's people out there that drink, you know, Coke like water. And it's not doing them so well. And mm -hmm. same with now your cell phone, right? Or your computer, whatever, like we're using it in such high dosages mm -hmm. that now we're seeing the effects, these lowered sperm counts or issues with breast cancer or even female reproduction, like anxiety. We're seeing all these things yeah. um, due to, we'll say, hyperdosing of, yeah. <laughs> of technology. Of technology, yeah. And, uh, and everything just being wired in once again, so it's all stacked on top of each other. Yeah. So it's not even just because of the phone, but it's also because of all the Wi-Fi networks around yeah. you, oh, yeah. the, the, the electrical cables above you, all the stuff which sounds very like, uh, yeah, it still sounds fake, really. It, does, it sounds like a conspiracy it, right? theory. Yeah, you can't see it, so it's really hard to, to measure, but uh, like the evidence, yeah, I don't know. I'd say check out this book. It's, it's, it's worth kind of reading and opening your eyes and maybe just expect, I think the, the main point really and the thing that he even recommends, um, his name's Nick Pino, uh, I think he lives in Montreal. Uh, so he is a Canadian, he's not just some weird like American writing all this stuff. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> Americans, <laughs> we appreciate you, we just don't understand you. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, he's a, uh, yeah, he's a fellow Canadian. Sometimes those, 
sometimes the those American scientists just seem to have these these radical <laughs> ideas and stuff. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a it's a local in some ways. Um, but he he says like he encourages people to take action before it becomes a more severe issue and just like don't don't wait for the science to actually catch up but try it out mm -hmm. so do do some of these things to try it out and it is really hard um he actually offers nice suggestions like cost wise too so like the low cost or free options versus if you do want to spend some money on some of these options um obviously because he's writing to not only just the lay person that has no clue about EMS, but also those that are already pretty dug into the, mm -hmm. the whole concept and really sold on it. And he wants to kind of show that he, I guess, embraces that part of it as well so for, for them reading his book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but simple things that also tie into this digital minimalism that you might want to do anyway, mm -hmm. like putting your phone on airplane mode at night. Or unplugging your router. Like, yeah, I've heard a lot of people do that. Like, yeah, that's that's one of the like the that's one of the primary suggestions mm -hmm. that a lot of these people make too. Is yeah, unplugging your router because it's closer than the neighbor's router that you might pick up a signal from. Anything, it's it's all about proximity to mm -hmm. all these things. So the further away you can get from it, uh, supposedly, and try mm -hmm. it for yourself, the better you'll feel. Yeah. So you'll sleep better, uh, less anxiety. Some people say like things like less ringing in their ears. Mm -hmm. um, I was just gonna say, like, even now, I'm just scanning the room, and I'm like, I can hear the fridge, and I can hear the pot, like, I can, yeah. there's all these things vibrating, and totally. how, yeah, how many times when the power goes out, like, do we all notice, like, it is eerily quiet, like, you don't realize how much distraction all these little sound waves, of yeah. the, of the buzzing, affects yeah. you, and ultimately, sound waves can, like, I mean, sound can break glass, yeah, it can be harmful, so totally. why can't it, like, why don't we think about that being harmful to the human body? Yeah, for sure. It's a thought. Yeah, so what what should people start with? What can we suggest? Mm. A bit of a call to action. Like yeah. I said, I've I've started to incorporate this myself. Uh, I think that was part of the reason we wanted to do this episode was just because we were both we need help. We were, <laughs> we were both struggling with some some things, take, technology taking over, social media taking over, and mm. recognizing that was the first step. So what can people? do what do you want to mm -hmm. encourage I think as as we've said kind of with every actionable advice we've given at first is just pay attention mm -hmm. like see what your idiosyncrasies are with technology pay attention to that and ask yourself how it's serving you like are you just sitting on your couch after a day of work scrolling through your phone is that serving you is that making you feel better and then flipping your script as you said like finding other things that actually pour into you and it doesn't have to be something exhausting if you're tired from a day at work then do something slow read a book have a bath like go for a slow walk yeah uh, it doesn't have to be you know go to the gym and get a crazy workout in just because you've got time to do it um but yeah pay attention and then see what you can just really slowly and gently because your body needs time to make new habits mm -hmm. um how can you shift that what can you do instead yeah Come up with ideas. Yeah, another one with with I, lots of people kind of stacking them together. You can also start doing some more audiobooks, right? If you want to go for a that. walk, yeah, uh, I think that's a good idea too. Is is check out you know occasionally do an audiobook so you can go for a walk, especially mm -hmm. if you are a reader who wants to. Or a great idea, listen to the Flowcast when you go for a walk. <laughs> you can do that too, yeah. <laughs> or all these other podcasts that I do want to recommend checking totally. out. In, in addition to this one for this topic and kind of learning more mm -hmm. more information about it but you can absolutely do that and and uh, check it out and yeah actually something really practical I've used lately um, is an app funny enough yeah. that apps can work for us too yeah. um, it's an app called Forest so I think that Peterborough people might like this um, and the idea is it's a productivity app where it locks you out of your phone for the time that you set, like you're in control of this. So I've, it's a dial, that's why I'm using my hands anyway. <laughs> um, I set mine, for example, for 45 minutes. I'm gonna just do some, like I had to write a paper, so I'm gonna write this paper for 45 minutes, and you know, my phone's there and tempting me, and for me, even if it's in another room, I still think about it. Yeah. So I need it to be like shut down. 
And what happens is in those 45 minutes or hour, whatever you set it to, a tree grows over that time. So it's like this cool, you're like, it almost feels like you're doing something good for the climate, even though you're not. Um, <laughs> and in order to use a different app on your phone, you must click a button that says give up. That wording is really powerful for me because yeah. I'm like, I'm not a quitter. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and when you click give up, you kill your tree, which to the, these eco people here, like it feels yucky to kill a tree. Yeah. And it says, are you sure you want to kill your tree? Like it uses the words kill and give up, which is really effective for me. Sure. Um, and then once you're done your, your set time, so if you haven't killed your tree and given up, um, it has this lovely little forest that you're slowly building and you're contributing to this little personal productivity for us. Yeah. And it also tells you, for sake of dopamine hit everybody, is that it tells you over the day, how many times you've used this app, it tells you exactly the number of hours and minutes, like down to the minute, how long you've been productive for the day. Cool. So it's really cool to be able to see like, oh, today like I pounded out six hours of productivity. Yeah. Check me out. The dopamine. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I built a tree, <laughs> or I built a forest, I sorry. Built a forest. Empire of digital greenery. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've, that, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I've heard that happen. It's, uh, it really effective. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Language is important to me. Yeah. And that was, yeah. So Forrest, if you guys need a little bit of someone to put some handcuffs on you, do it yourself by downloading the Forrest app. Cool. And uh, and also something you mentioned there with, with even if the phone's in a different room, mm -hmm. it does get easier over yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Just like with anything that like you're trying to build a habit. Just realize like there's gonna be some hardship at first, but yep. it'll get easier. You'll get better at it, and just stick with it. Just like um, quitting smoking, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. linear. No, <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, usually these kind of call to actions incorporate some sort of uh, hashtag or something, but I don't think we're gonna do that for the sake of this being a digital minimalism challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do feel like sharing your success story, you can. I don't know, email us or send us a message or we'll get back to you or between whatever. 10 30 and 4. Exactly. <laughs> no, at 10 Sorry, 30 not between. or at 4. Forgive not me. That's okay. <laughs> um, but also just do it for you. Yeah, like, exactly. I hope that we've had enough conversation in this podcast to convince you that it's better for you, it's better for your business, it's better for your efficiency, it's better for your sleep, your body, all these things. Like, do you care enough about yourself? Sorry, this is a scare tactic. I grew up in church, the evangelical <laughs> church. Do you care enough about yourself to, uh, you know... To not kill your trees. <laughs> to not, don't kill your digital trees, guys. Don't yeah. give up. <laughs> yeah. I think it's important to, to choose these things, like, as we talked about people posting on social media for other people. Yeah. Like, if you're, if you're going to practice digital minimalism, it's there's no benefit in being like, look at me, I'm being a minimalist while you're recording an Instagram story. Because that's just, you're looking for that dopamine hit. You're looking for a pat on the back. Like, do it for you. Mm -hmm. And see what happens to your life, your behavior, your thoughts, your anxiety, your social life, all mm -hmm. these things. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Yeah. And and check out the book or listen to the audiobook of Digital Minimalism. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Digital Minimalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's got a lot of the, the ending, it, you know, it ends with a lot of these success stories of people that yeah. lost 40 or 100 pounds. They they picked up new hab, um, new like, um, sorry, hobbies mm -hmm. that they that they incorporated in really cool ways and just found a lot more meaning in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's what flow is once again. So it comes back around. Mm -hmm. So yeah, do it for you and yeah. and. Hopefully, or you know, things things will happen in your favor because of it, and hopefully that this podcast gave you some reasons and a realization of why that's important and valuable. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> mic drop. I think so. I think Except it's we won't drop this no, mic. No, it's, but... <laughs> it's precious good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the next episode. Uh, but yeah, all right. Thank you, and yeah, thanks everybody for listening, and, and good luck. Yes.